Hey everyone, and welcome to the NCAST. I'm Guy Weissmantle, your host and Executive Vice President of Marketing here at NContracts. In this podcast, our subject matter experts from across the company will be talking with industry thought leaders about relevant topics and trends in compliance and risk management for financial institutions. You'll learn the latest tips and tools to manage risk in this ever-changing environment. Let's get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the NCAST. My name is Rafael Deleon. I'm the Senior Vice President of Industry Engagement with NContracts. And today I'm joined by one of our partners, Risk Scout, and two people from Risk Scout, Ryan McInerney and Kristen Parker, who will be joining me today for our lively discussion on high-risk banking. So with that, I'd like to kind of jump in. Ryan and Kristen, would you give us a little bit of background about yourselves? Sure thing. So my name is Ryan McInerney. I'm a senior manager in compliance here at Risk Scout. Previously was a regulator with the OCC for a few years, and then uh, did a little bit of secondary education over at UVA in the uh, Master of Science in Business Analytics. And I'm joined here with Kristen Parker. Yeah, I'm Kristen Parker. I'm the director of compliance at Risk Scout. My background is all banking. I've been in banking for nearly 20 years, mostly compliance, BSA. I came, my last year was a BSA officer at a $4 billion institution, and we banked about every high-risk business there was out there. So I've got a lot of history in this space, which is why I'm so passionate about what we're going to talk about today. Great, great. So with your background, especially with the institution and both Ryan and my background uh, with the OCC, uh, I think, again, we'll have a good and lively conversation in terms of all aspects of this. So While we kind of get into this, I I think it's really interesting what the United States is facing right now. It's almost a kind of a quagmire because it's really undeniable in my mind that the cannabis industry in some form or derivation is here to stay. Current estimates of what I've read is there's 47 states and the District of Columbia that have some form of legalization, medical or that's including with attributes of the farm bill with limited THC and CBD and CBD products as they've developed. So when I saw that statistic, I thought that was pretty interesting. I think, again, most of us will typically focus on kind of the 19 states plus the District of Columbia that have recreational marijuana cannabis for use. So with that, what I also find very fascinating is given the recent statistics that have been put out by FinCEN, There's about 684 financial institutions that are doing some form of banking with cannabis or high-risk banking. And that 684 is compared to really a total of almost about 10,000 banks, savings and loans, and credit unions across the U.S. So really only about 6 to 7%. And so while we see a big trend with legalization on states. I think just even in this past year, there were four additional states that have had uh, approved additional use in their states. We're seeing this momentum. So with that momentum, it creates a kind of a hobbled industry because it is still, at least marijuana or cannabis is still under considered under the Controlled Substances Act. And guided by that. So on a federal level, I think, as most people know, it is still a criminal or considered a criminal activity. And then there have been some recent guidance that have put in put out by FinCEN, the DOJ, in terms of the infamous coal memo. What are the things that financial institutions need to follow? And this is, again, where something where your company, Risk Out, does a lot of important work. So, Kristen, let me turn it over to you to kind of talk about high-risk banking and what that entails. Sure. So, so while cannabis traditionally comes to mind when it comes to high-risk banking, it is a huge, it's a huge part of, of this whole sector, higher, higher risk banking. But really, it can be defined in many different ways. There's different ways to, to think about high-risk banking. Cannabis sticks out like a sore thumb now due to a lot of talk and a lot of legalization, like you, you said, Raphael. But really, the other industries fall into that place as well. You know, you can really think of higher risk industries as being historically either cash intensive. Maybe they require additional licensing by states. Maybe they just potentially are subject to easier illicit activity, potentially. Really, it's any business that requires potentially more oversight by a BSA compliance group. Uh, You can think of it, you know, we said uh, hemp. 
-hmm. CBD that falls in the cannabis space, money, service businesses, ATMs, crypto, any of those are, are really part of the higher risk banking space. So it's just, it's, it's not so niche anymore. You know, it's literally everywhere in everybody's backyard. Right. So, but you, you did touch on the commonalities that are involved. Again, they're really kind of cash intensive businesses that can be subject to illicit activity, but that require really what I would say, robust compliance management and risk processes that need to be put in place there. Is that correct? Yeah, certainly, certainly. So what we're we're finding and what's, I think, been known, but just bubbling up more to the top these days is that, again, it's happening in your backyard. There's no more of this, you know, oh, we don't bank this. We don't bank that. You know, we don't do, we talk to a lot of banks that will say, we no, we will never touch cannabis. Well, okay, that's fine if that's not in your risk appetite. However, how do you know that you're not? banking cannabis. So it's just, you can't pull the wool over someone's eyes or pretend, you know, pretend it's not happening over here. Uh, You've got to address it in some way or manner because you're banking these guys, whether you realize it or not, especially if you don't have robust practices in place, if you're not choosing to bank someone to ensure that everybody in the institution knows that and you're able to vet each business to ensure they're not part of that. So would you agree that pretty much the two acronyms, MSB for money service businesses and MRBs for marijuana related businesses that are kind of used are are a good kind of catch all of kind of most of these areas that are high risk. Yeah, it really, there's probably 40 or 50 different industries that fit into the high risk category. You know, they can go down to even political campaigns. Uh, And there's a lot of oversight that needs to happen in a lot of different industries uh, that I think what people just hear so much of is cannabis now, which is so important to talk about it because it is an extremely cash intensive industry. And if we don't get these people banked, there's public safety issues that ensue after that because there's cash everywhere. But it doesn't just stick with THC in that context. It's your money service businesses that are cash intensive. It's ATMs that are cash intensive. And what I have really learned over the years is that most of these businesses are just truly misunderstood businesses. It's not necessarily they're out here wanting to do nefarious things, right? Uh, They just are, there's specific reasons they chose to get into these businesses that are either personal or economical, but here they are starting in this business and then they can't find anybody in their own community to bank them. That's where we really, I think, I don't want to say fail as a banking community, but pretty much in that context of realizing these are your neighbors that are trying to find somewhere to bank. So, yeah, um, in in fact, it's really interesting kind of looking back on this. I think a lot of people heard Operation Choke Point at one point in time, and that's where some regulators were, and not all, some regulators were encouraging (laughs) banks or discouraging them from participating largely with money surface businesses. And this had a huge impact especially in the South and Southwest uh, and borders of Mexico. I, I, I would also kind of tell you, even tell you the story. This goes back to years. My, my father was a banker for a number of years in San Antonio, Texas, and had, given the fact that he was bilingual, dealt with a lot of the money services businesses that were exchanging money from we, between Texas and Mexico, and that always came under a lot of scrutiny by the regulators, and particularly the OCC. But that not that anybody's picking out winners and losers. So that's where I kind of start off talking about kind of cannabis and hemp, because it it has layered on a whole level of complexity that was not there with some of these other businesses that people are trying to figure out. But that it's like anything else with high risk. You should not get into it if you don't know what you're doing. Absolutely. And I think where we run up against a lot is just I don't know what I don't know as a banker. And we already have this whole laundry list of things we're responsible for as BSA officers, compliance officers that, that don't even entail getting into a niche market and, and really growing and scaling a program that's a high, that deals with higher risk businesses. So you've got all these other responsibilities. And then all of a sudden on the side, you've got to learn 
all of these things, nuances that are in these industries that, you know, THC cannabis, we don't have, even have any proper regulatory guidance out there except one 2014 memo, you know, that, that touches on things. So it's also how do how do you as a banker feel comfortable in that space as well? And that's where you really need to leverage partnerships with people of, who are subject matter experts, that that's their job to know these industries and educate you on them. So, Ryan, when you're talking to a banker and having been also a former regulator, what are the kind of concerns or red flags that go up in your mind when you're hearing from a banker start to want to say, hey, we're looking at doing this. What what should we do? Uh, what 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 is it that we don't know? What what are some of those red flags that you you know go off for you? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when you're looking at any institution that's trying to get into a new program, it's do I understand it and do I have the combination of staff and software or whatever solutions I'm going to be using to actually evaluate my customers and maintain that sort of due diligence that I need to be doing on an ongoing basis to know what they're doing. You know, sometimes I've, I've gone into institutions, a lot of institutions, and it's just a heavy paper-based program. And that's great. It's fine if you have the appropriate staff for that, if you have a small enough uh, number of customers that you're taking on, but it's also a lot more burdensome and it's harder to review, it's harder to automate. So making sure those processes in place are actually set up appropriately for you to take on that that whole program and look at it, get all the information in, digest it, understand it, present it to management, present it to the board. Those are those are huge aspects. So do you typically find, because you bring up a good point that management understands this and it's gone to the board, do you usually find that they've already talked to their board of directors before talking to risk out or do they do some preliminary work beforehand to kind of find out about your your services, uh, what you offer, how you do things, and then go back and put together a plan for the board? Uh, or is it a combination of both? It's funny. It can be either direction, right? Sometimes you have a board member that says, you know what, I'm interested in cannabis. I think we should explore this. And nobody at the bank has taken that approach yet. So it's not something they've really looked into yet. And so at that point, you start doing that initial assessment saying, okay, what's the market size? Where can we enter? What are the state laws and regulations in the areas that we're going to enter? Versus sometimes it's gone from a management perspective where they say, you know, we see we have opportunity here. Now we have to take this information and convince the board that it's something we're actually able to do because there's so much confusion. You mentioned before, it's a schedule one substance. So some people think, you know, we can't touch this at all. It's federally illegal. And that's not necessarily how things actually function, given the guidance that FinCEN published in 2014. Yeah, in fact, um, so I really find it interesting that, again, while I was at the OCC and you were too, we would hear from a number of bankers talking about these things and, and kind of wanted to keep it at arm's length. Uh, and yet there were a number of banks and savings and loans and credit unions that were doing this and successfully. In fact, uh, as a number of bankers would bring this up in discussions with us at the OCC, what I would frequently cite was the fact that up until recently, there was not an enforcement action against any financial institution up until this past February. And it wasn't that, that institution that had the enforcement action in a union, it was a credit union really came about because of kind of a really poor systems in that. So can you talk a little bit about that and kind of what are the typical situations you usually find yourself in and how does your company help a, a bank who's starting to explore this? Well, I think uh, Kristen said it best before is we don't know what we don't know. And that goes for if it was a regulator or if it's somebody at the bank. And I think with a lack of knowledge become, comes fear. And if you're scared of something, you're less than willing to enter it. And so as these companies, as these banks, financial institutions, whether it's a credit union, whoever it is, is taking on these programs, understanding the risks is the most important part first off, right? I need to know what am I taking on? Is it going to be a hemp company? Is it going to be uh, cannabis? Is it going to be THC related? What's our risk appetite there? And Risk Out can help with identifying that initial strategy, putting together those policies, procedures that you're actually comfortable developing the program with. But then the second part is, how do we take on this extra burden of looking at these companies? Because it's it's more frequent reviews, right? If I'm taking on, say, say a, a fisherman, I don't think I'm going to that fisherman and saying every three months, hey, I need to check and see what you're doing. Have you entered any new markets? Uh, is your marketing material appropriate? Who have you been selling to? What kinds of products? Those touch points can be can be improved with a, a software solution in addition to the existing staff or augmenting new staff that you're taking on. 
So making sure you have a reasonable approach to looking at your program. I think one thing on the reasonable side, if you look at the OCC, it's a risk-based approach to supervision. If you look at FATF, they say a risk-based approach, a reasonable approach. So there's a lot of different ways we can put these programs together. There's a lot of different ways that you can partner with Risk Scout to look at this, this information, digest it, and use it. Okay. So uh, I think, again, those are uh, some really good examples and backgrounds. But uh, as Kristen was talking about earlier, this goes beyond just kind of money service businesses and marijuana, hemp, uh, things like that, but to crypto. And yet the, the, the same thing that we're seeing kind of with crypto there's a, and uh, marijuana, there's a momentum behind it that is kind of moving banks towards this to look at doing this. This is customers that are adopting this or taking part in uh, buying Bitcoin or other crypto assets, uh, looking at uh, marijuana related businesses or looking more closely at the payment side on money service businesses. So walk us through again, one of those examples uh, and what are some of the questions you would begin? What are some of the things that bankers that are listening to this NCAST should be concerned about or thinking about if they're going to get in these areas? Well, I can I can speak to that because I actually launched one of the first Federal Reserve Bank approved hemp programs in the U.S. right shortly after the Farm Bill passed in December. I believe it was 2018. It all feels like a blur between <laughs> now and then. But what I think is one of the biggest points we need to get across here is no matter if you are a small, small BSA group or a large BSA group, you've really got to take into consideration your staffing needs. You either need to have proper staffing. You always need to have proper staffing. You need to always have that software piece of it that's going to help you manage this program. And I will tell you from my own experience that don't be me and go into a program and launch one thinking, oh, well, they're not going to market it. So it's just going to be this small little program. I didn't know we were the first ones to do it when we did it. And that word in the hemp industry, it's the hemp industry is much smaller than it looks. You know, it's a large, large industry to bank, but those guys talk to each other. That I went from five businesses to 150 businesses in a matter of two months. And I had just me as a subject matter expert. I had no software to help me. And I had the rest of my BSA program to run. So, you know, because of that, it wasn't scalable. You know, what we had was not scalable. We were also garbage in, garbage out sometimes because we didn't have, we had just me. I was reviewing the potential relationships, but I'm cranking through them. And we didn't have any structure onto who we really wanted to bank at that time because we didn't really know the industry that well. So we didn't have proper filters in place to to keep the, you know, the ones that really fit our long-term goals in place. And so we were just letting anybody in the door that met certain criteria. So the point being is, is you've got to speak up when you are launching a program and understand that you're either going to need extra people or you're going to need software because there's no reason to even get into a higher risk industry banking that group at all. If you're not going to scale up, it's not worth the risk to your institution. Having five or 10 customers traditionally just isn't worth you you spinning your wheels with staffing to do it. You know, if you just have a handful of them and they're just because you have, you know, that these guys are in other uh, businesses and just fell into the cannabis industry by by default, then that's one thing. But if you're going to get into this program, any type of high risk banking program, it really needs to be one that you can scale up. And again, don't be me. Get do your due diligence, do your research on what it's going to take to actually run one of these programs efficiently and effectively. Uh, One thing that I know all three of us have talked about is how difficult it is to find staff right now and also to find qualified staff. And I think, Kristen, one thing we've talked about is making sure you had contingency plans for your subject matter experts, because the people that understand these programs, there's few and far between. And so when you think about, do I staff this whole thing up or do I make the staff I have more efficient? Do I give them the tools and the resources to perform their job better? 
And it's a, it's a balancing act and trying to make that decision, but it's one that really needs to be considered. Yeah. I would look at this little, you know, uh, again, and just phrase it differently. Uh, as an examiner, if I walked in and you told me you were, you know, going to do a new loan program, you know, I would usually take into account, do you have the, the staff and resources? And yet, if you're looking at something that is high risk, one of these categories that we've talked about, I would really look at, have you established the right personnel segregated who are not involved in other parts of the bank who can devote their time and energy and that the bank has devoted time and energy and resources towards its implementation. So due diligence from a lot of different facets, the due diligence that the bank and board need to do to understanding the due diligence that you had to do in your old jobs to look at the customers you were bringing on. And you talked about those kind of filters. Who are we going to take? Who are we not? What are those kind of changes that we're making? Yeah. And I think you bring up a really good point in in many facets there, but really segregating out who is the one who's approving these accounts? Who's the one who, you know, well, a lot of times we'll run into institutions and we'll, we'll go in there to help them clean it up maybe an existing program. And what we're finding is that that's their frontline staff who's approving the bu- the businesses that are banking here. Well, you, that's, that's really could be a conflict of interest, right? If they have sales goals, should they, are they really going to have the same objectives that we do as a BSA officer who, who knows the potential risks that these businesses have to our institution long-term? Not typically, you know, you just don't want to have those blurred lines. So you really need to have separation of duties, when you're building out programs of, you know, a really smooth workflow on how the customers apply for an account, who approves the account, who maintains a relationship after the fact, who manages customer touch points. All of that can get really messy when you're dealing with multiple departments. And that's why it's also really beneficial to have a software that you can manage the customer relationship from frontline to your ongoing compliance BSA duties that you're required to do per regulations. So there's not a whole lot of difference in my mind in terms of how we're already, uh, at least financial institutions, are looking at third-party risk management. This is a different type of third-party risk management, how you're doing it. So a lot of the same type systems and processes, and especially due diligence, are extremely important. Oh, I can't begin to tell you that. And it's all these nuances within these different industry types, too, that, you know, when you're onboarding, when you decide to go into a state and bank let's just say THC, you should know those, that state rules and regulations inside out and backwards. And every business is going to have to be required a license. You should know what license is required. You should know this, but that's hard to do because you're working in industries that are pretty dynamic and it could be this county in this state doesn't allow it. You know, so really getting those nuances down and understanding them is very difficult for a one person, two person show, which is another reason you should leverage, you know, subject matter experts to to be there to assist you through these processes when you're launching a program. And then just when you're onboarding customers, each and every customer. I was going to say, think about any, when it's, you're lumping all of these high risk, uh, business types into one program, right? This is my high risk program. That is going to have, you really should be breaking that out a little bit more because maybe I do have a canvas program and I run that incredibly well. Well, there's completely different set of things that I'm going to be looking for at onboarding and ongoing for say private ATMs, right? Like I'm not talking about how am I loading my ATM with cash when I'm looking at a cannabis company, or I'm not looking at the BSA program at maybe a cannabis company when I am at a money service business. So each one of these has these different, you know, inconsistencies that you really need to understand and flush that out in the policy procedures before you actually open the program. So you talk about kind of flushing those out through the policies and procedures. But again, I think it's it's really almost myopic to think I'm just I'm here in, you know, in the state of Virginia and I'm only going to be dealing with banks in Virginia or, or licenses. And yet. Kind of like you were saying, now all of a sudden now you're getting calls from all around the country. Hey, can you help bank us? So how do you manage without some sort of software solution or process to look at, you know, the myriad of 50 different licensing requirements for each one of these different categories of high risk businesses? I wish I had an answer for that, but I guess my answer is you don't. (laughs) You just don't. I mean, 
I, I did, I lived that life. And, you know, it, I was so dedicated to that hemp program because I knew I was, I'm in a state there where people will be growing it everywhere. And it was better interest for our community bank to serve their community, right? I spent my time, free time learning this industry and I would spend times outside of work understanding it and all that. However, I was having to do that consistently and constantly because it was changing all the time and it still is several years later. I mean, so you really, you, you really, if you're going to do it right, you need, again, I hate to be beating a dead horse here with it, but subject, that subject matter expert relationship. Well, I, I think the only thing I want to add is just, it's, uh, it's kind of funny. Kristen was dealing with basically a, a field of dreams for a hemp program, right? And she built it and they came and that's what you have to be prepared for. And if you're, I, I don't know how you research all of that without some support from either subject matter experts or really staffing up. You, you need to have those partnerships to make sure you get the information or able to use it. So before I kind of move on, Kristen, so what did the bank do when you left? You had helped to kind of get this up and running. Were there, were there other staff that had a sense of what was going on that you had been working with, or did they have to scramble to find somebody so it gets back to kind of retaining and, and uh, attracting talent? This um, financial institution did not have a backup for me. They had somebody that they knew enough to be dangerous, you know, so they squeaked by for a little bit, but ended up having to exit that whole industry altogether because they did that. That's something that's, I think I say more often than not is what are you going to do if your SME leaves, you know, you got, and that's the beauty of our platform is it's designed to, for someone to be able to pick up the next day and know exactly where everything is and know exactly where the program stands. And that should be nothing outstanding in there. And you, you know, all of the things that gave me heartburn in that role I was in and, and managing that many, many high risk banking programs, we've put blood, sweat and tears into our software to solve all those things that really kept me up at night because I know I'm not the only one. Right. who's dealing with these pain points. Yeah. And I can say Chris and I are just excited to help people when they're saying, oh yeah, we want to do this in our program, or we're trying to work through this. This is our pain point. We're like, yeah, let's, let's figure out how to, to develop that workflow the best way for you and your staff. So <laughs> let's, let's kind of talk about best practices. And usually even for me as a regulator, I'll, I'll kind of start with looking at this enforcement action. And I think, again, this is a kind of a good practice for any institution in any area if a bank is subject to that enforcement action, what did the regulators lay out? What were they requiring? So some of the things that were kind of laid out for this uh, credit union, they had acquired 254 new clients and 150 of them were MRBs, marijuana related businesses. And despite its fast growth, it did not employ sufficient uh, resources, particularly individuals to handle the influx of clients. So Uh, Some of the requirements or recommendations that came, uh, the cease and desist order that came about uh, to implement an automated system to monitor for suspicious activity. And that's something your company does? Yeah. So we uh, assist in all of that ongoing due diligence efforts. So really being helping check those boxes for ongoing monitoring of of these type of relation, automating those processes for you, not automating to the point where a BSA officer gets, gets, you know, all worried, uh, but automating enough to really help manage and scale up that type. When you hear the word automation from a banker or a regulator, that doesn't necessarily mean, Hey, I can just put this to the side and I don't touch it anymore. What it, what it should mean is this makes the process a lot easier for me and streamlines my ability to make decisions. And so that's what we've done here at Risk Scout. So you can take the information and make an informed decision faster than you would have if you had to gather all that information by yourself. So again, that gets back to the same thing with third-party risk management. It's that ongoing kind of monitoring, ongoing due diligence. You know, again, one of the other aspects of this was engaging a third party to help validate suspicious activity monitoring immediately file SAR suspicious activity reports and develop a system to ensure that they were accurate, complete, and uh, timely filed. And cease opening any new MRBs and cease opening any MSBs and engage a qualified third party to kind of review the MSB activity and determine if any additional SAR filings were necessary. 
So it is pretty intensive looking about that as we've been talking about through this entire NCAP. Anything else you look at in terms of kind of best practices that you recommend to institutions based on your experience? Part- partnerships are really important in, in really helping you stay abreast of situations. So uh, let's say, for instance, we have an institution in a state that's banking THC, but something has changed there. We're all, we are pushing out notifications um, to our, our and, and calling our, our financial institutions to really educate them and help them understand what has changed that may affect them, their program altogether and, and who they're actually currently banking even. Uh, really pushing and, and helping them know when to really raise their hand and reach out for help. That's where I think a lot of people get lost in this space quite a bit. I would say it's kind of twofold uh, between not just raising out, you know, raising your hand and asking for help, but also having regular and ongoing communication with your regulator to let them know. And and this would be the case with any new product or service that the bank is or financial institution is developing. Because again, most people think of the regulators as the no people and much like they think of the compliance people as like, no, you can't do this versus Hera, if you're going to do this, let's make sure that you've got the kind of right systems and processes in place that the regulator is expecting for the the type of business that you're doing. I had a really great relationship with my regulators because I I I think I what a lot of us miss as BSA officers and it's just not talked about a lot is how you want us to reach out to you. You know, the, and you may be having quarterly meetings. Like Ryan was telling me that OCC has quarterly meetings with their financial institutions, right? Guess who didn't know that was happening? The BSA officer, me. So, you know, like there were, there, there's probably, there's some siloing, there's some disconnection that just naturally happens in banking in general, but I know I, people should know and that they can reach out to their regulators and they want to know what is important is you don't want to make the mistake of launching a program without your regulator knowing or B, scaling your program and not letting them know how large it is so that they don't come in with the proper staffing to actually review your your program sufficiently. Uh, You just always want them to be in the know. They feel better that way is what I feel like. Is that true? Would you guys say you guys feel better once you're in the know? (laughs) Definitely. Definitely. I, I, you know, I would always say that, you know, nobody likes surprises, any of us, except maybe at Christmas and Valentine's Day uh, for anybody, but uh, more so regulators don't. And I would say that given my, you know, tenure with the OCC of over 32 years, when those quarterly reviews were implemented, and I date myself going, going back to that, but I really, I would say that at least for the OCC and all of the agencies that implemented regularly monitoring, that helped to change the kind of tone, tenor, and dynamics between bankers and the regulators, where bankers didn't feel as concerned uh, or wary about reaching out like, hey, I'm going to let them know what we're doing. Uh, It was a much better process if you're helping to build something and the regulators are providing input while that's being built versus, oh, I've just got a product, the system being built. And now I'm going to tell my regulators what I did. And they're like, well, did you think of A, B, C, D? Uh, And like, no, well, those things need to be done before you implement that. Yeah, I'll say my portfolio institutions, when I was with the OCC, they I told them I had an open door policy, basically, like if you had a question, if you were planning on doing something, just shoot me an email or we'll jump on the phone, whatever it was. And we had a lot of good conversations about whether that was developing a program or if there was some new risk that they were a little bit concerned about. We had those conversations and I think it helped them to develop their programs. So I would encourage anyone to try and manage that relationship with your regulator. So with Risk Scout, is there um, uh, a heavier number of institutions that you're involved with that are involved in one particular activity, or does it seem kind of spread out among all those activities we were listing, whether it's ATM, cryptos, MSBs, MRBs, where, again, you find you're getting more of the questions now? You know, I, th- I think what we, we're seeing obviously is a lot of cannabis questions, but what is nice about our platform is you can manage multiple high risk programs in one platform. So if you have an MSB program and then you have a THC program and a hemp program, they're all going to look 
you know, pretty drastically different from each other on what your policies, procedures, who you're wanting to onboard, whatnot. But in our platform, you can build workflows to onboard those customers and maintain all of their ongoing compliance duties within the platform. Uh, so what we end up seeing a lot of the time, Raphael, is they want to get into hemp. Oh, it's not a year later, they're already into THC. And then they're like, oh, wait, now ATMs? So just, it seems like if you're in one niche, you're usually, you know, expanding out pretty rapidly. And what's nice is we can grow with you. You know, we can help you get into these programs um, very simplistically too, because I think a lot of what has happened in the high risk industry, especially when you start talking crypto and whatnot, is everybody has almost just basically overcomplicated everything. And we help you step back and really be able to digest it. I like for people to explain stuff to me like I'm five sometimes, you know, and that's how right. we sometimes have to approach it. And that's that's fine because this is all a learning curve for a lot of people. Good. Uh, any last takeaways that you have? I'd say, uh, well, you mentioned before, what are some of the best practices, right? And I think the most important thing is developing that support network that gives you the resources and the, the knowledge that you need. I think Kristen's talking about, okay, well, we're growing with you, right? So we're helping you figure out the training for how does everyone understand this business line? Or we're talking about the the process. How does this process work? And does everyone understand what's going on? I think the other important thing is besides that resource network is information sharing within the institution. So when you look at people on the front line, know something different than someone in senior management knows. And having maybe round tables saying, this is what we're seeing. How does that affect the risk appetite for this program? Or this is what our risk appetite is. Does that make sense from the onboarding procedures that we have in place? Making sure everyone is on the same page. Good. I I think it's one of those key areas that we we look at with banking. And I would say that over my career, what we really saw was an industry that was really looking at kind of heavily focused on loans. Is the customer paying or not? Are they paying as agreed? What's happening with their financial condition? Having an understanding day to day since they lived in the community, what was going on with that customer? And now this is just exponentially increased, whether it's with third party risk management, with your vendors, or with customers that are high-risk customers. And what is changing with them daily, whether that's licensing requirements, state requirements, you know, did they violate some term that they had? So what I would kind of say is that whole life cycle, cradle to grave, and how that you know is impacting the bank. And it's no longer something that can be done in isolation. Oh, we looked at this once and we'll look at it again in 12 or 18 months because many things change and we've seen that in a, you know, even in one, two month, three month period. And that reminds me, Raphael, but it's a, it's a great point too, is there's so much changing in these. And I've gone to so many institutions where there's no pricing difference between high risk customers and your normal customer. And then you see that de-risking the removal of those customers is not profitable. What you need to, not only on the compliance side and the risk management side, that's important, but so is the pricing side and making sure you're pricing these customers appropriately to have a return on your investment that is actually going to benefit the institution. You can't just take these on the same way that you're taking on a normal customer. There's a higher level of work that goes behind it. Well, again, I I think that's subject for another NCAST at some other point, kind of talking about looking at these pricing considerations, what banks need to take into consideration there. Because just from my experience, I've heard a whole range of kind of pricing considerations from uh, how much you're charging to look at getting into any one of these spaces and what this means. Again, this is really informative. I enjoy it and I've learned a lot. And again, thank you for participating with us today. Thank you, Raphael. It was our pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having us. Hey, everyone. That wraps up another great episode of the NCAST, where we are able to talk with people on the front lines of risk and compliance across the financial services industry. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review. And if you're not subscribed yet, we invite you to do so on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you soon.